What if all of a sudden none of you can move out your seat? You'll be chained to your chair. You'll have to eat what they give you. You'll be forced to urinate there, defecate there, sleep there, and your freedom to simply by just to live, to learn, will be stripped away from you. How long do you think you will last? A day, or maybe a week. But now, forget about a week long. Think three years. Think twenty years, or twenty-two years, or in some cases, thirty years. Such human practices have happened to many severe mentally disabled patients, and unfortunately, many of them are being chained or locked by their own family member. According to Human Rights Watch, many of patients who has mental disability are being chained or locked, are forced to defecate, sleep, and live in confined living condition. So they result in many various infection, malnutrition, muscle deterioration, and even sexual abuse. In Cambodia, there's no exact data on how many people are out there are being held against their wills, but globally, there are thousands of hundreds of people are being abused in such way. To address this problem, in Cambodia, there's a project called Operation Unchained, which was created by TPO. So Operation Unchained is a group of specialized team who travel around Cambodia to identify and offer free at home treatment for patients who are being chained or locked by their own family. They prioritize patients who are living with family members that are elders, living under the poverty line and living in rural area. To date, Operation Unchained has helped and treated 133 patients and 102 of them have now been unchained and have rejoined their family and some, and some even got to see sunlight again. When I first heard about a project in 2019, I called TPO, I said, I want to learn more. So I, I, I joined them for a mission. I arrived to a province called Prey Wayne and I arrived to a wooden house. There were no wall. There were holes on the roof. There were mud everywhere. And I remember there was some unpleasant smell. And there it was a naked man who lay around on one of the pillars of the house. His skin was peeling, his hair was long, and his ankle was chain, rusty chain. And I learned that this patient was chained by his own mother. I began because it was my first experience, so I began to feel this sort of uncomfortable feeling in my stomach, nauseous. And the feeling that I remember the most was, was anger, because it was me, another human being, see another human being being chained. So I began telling this story on my Facebook page called Ding with Ping An on 2019. And then we start seeing a lot of comments that people share. I have the same thing. I also some even confess that they chain their own family member asking for help. Give us their phone number so that they can call and we can call them to help. And I know that it's the beginning of a much bigger thing. So during the COVID-19, I was in the US. Um, I pursuing my master's degree in health and risk communication. I started to look through 57 D identified note um, of patient that under the care of TPO from the approval of TPO. So my professor and I started our qualitative research and we have learned some of pattern of behavior on why family member chain their own son or daughter or family member. We learned one, they do so to protect themselves from the aggressive behavior of the patient. And second, they do so to protect the patient from wandering around and getting abused from other people. But you may ask, what about treatment? What did you learn about treatment? We also learned that ineffective treatment from specialized care, from unspecialized care, sorry, from traditional healer, from self-medication, were the first choice of treatment, and those were aren't effective. We also learned that a hundred percent of the family member mentioned that they are distant from home to available specialized care were the main barrier to getting treatment. 
when I come back from the U.S., I know that when I looked through all those notes, there was a chance wasn't enough. So I call up TPO again in early 2023, and we go on a mission with them again. So I I travel around Cambodia with them for many days uh, to rural area and met with many patients. Some as as old, some has been chained for 30 years, and we began this conversation. But throughout my journey, I learned three new things outside of my research. One, survival. Some cases, the mother is as old as 80 years old. Imagine an 80 years old mother, single, living with a child who is aggressive, having schizophrenia. She has no choice but to chain him to protect herself, but also to protect her child. But most importantly, she did so, chain him, because she needed to go out there, earn some money to feed both of them. An 80 years old single mother. So when I started wanting to answer my own question that was in my head back then, how could one be so cruel enough to change someone else? It wasn't cruelty. It was survival. She did so because she needed to survive, also because she wanted him to survive. And there were so much complex circumstances around this issue. Another thing that I've learned is hope. Remember, the, the, uh, in earlier, we show a photo of a guy uh, that I met, the patient, that was laying around naked at the wooden house. Earlier, the team has shared a photo of him as well, me and him together. This is him now. I couldn't recognize him. The TPO team said, Pingan, this is the, the, the first patient you have met when he was chained at the, at the wooden house. And I, I was in shock. He smiled at me. I was have this sense of hope in my stomach because when I look at his leg, he's no longer chained. He's living with his family. He's together with his family again. So I know that hope is real. Hope for recovery for mentally disabled patient is real in Cambodia because of project operation and chain. Three. I also learned that we are fighting stigma. There's just so many superstitious beliefs out there, inaccurate information. When I start posting a series of my video in 2023, and um, a lot of cases, different cases of young girl, um, older men, we started to receive a lot of comment, countless of comment, asking for help, sharing their story, posting photo of a patient being chained and locked. They leave the phone number. They begging us for help. I know this isn't what we want to hear, that we know a lot of patients are out there. But this is good because this is a beginning of how we can solve this problem by generate conversation. And now we know that stigma has been fought because conversation or things that have never been talked about before have only talked in closed door and now being talked in public. So this dialogue, this conversation are beginning to solve this issue. But of all this problem and what you've learned today, what can we do to help? The first thing we can do is that we can support what has already been proven to be effective. We know that Operation Unchained has done great work, 77% of recovery rate with patients. So we can do so by share good story to people we know, generate more conversation, dialogue, fight stigma, and reuse inaccurate information. We can also donate to Operation Unchained so that they can do their great work, expand their workforce to help more patients. And I'm standing here actually very proud and thanking to all the Cambodian people because in the last two or three months when I start my campaign, Unchained Me, they have donated $20,000 through my campaign and this directly go to Operation Unchained so that they can operate for another year. Thank you. But we need so much more. We need more funding. Two, what else can we do? We know that a lot of patients and a lot of family seek traditional healer or religious institution as their first choice of treatment because of a lot of superstitious belief. And there's nothing wrong with that. But a lot of patients had a delay in treatment, which means it wasn't their condition, causing the aggressive behavior to be stronger. So 
what we can also do is we can collaborate with traditional healer. We can also collaborate with religious institution so that they can recommend family member to take patient to get a specialized treatment so that both specialized care and traditional healing method or spiritual method, the safe one, can go hand in hand for treating patient. Three, what else can we do? We need to design a proper community-based health education program that use simple language, simple tool. We can also deploy former patient, family member, or community leader to go around the community and share their experience to teach people about the basic knowledge about mental illness. At least they know how to deal with patient and what, what not to do when dealing with patient when they are aggressive. From a bigger point of view, this conversation right here need to integrate into school for younger students so they can be more aware at, at early age. It need to also be integrated at workplace, our dining table, for me and my family, for your family, your parents, and also at religious gathering, your friend gathering at a coffee table. We need to normalize what should have been normalized a long time ago which is this conversation. Fourth, and I keep this one short because I know they know, but they need to keep up the paces, pick up the paces. More budget allocation on healthcare infrastructure, specifically on mental illness. We need more specialized doctor. We need more clinics so it have better access for people living in rural area. We need a better benefit for frontline worker so that they can be better insured to do is such a dangerous work. We also need to encourage more people to pursue this medical field because there's a lack of human resource out there. But most importantly, we need more research evidence to drive our action. I'm gonna end this talk again with one thing. Right now, what we can do is that we can help what have already proven to be effective, support operation and chain help them to help unchain more patients. Thank you.